Thanks, John. So, uh, as John said, um, I graduated from UTAS about five years ago, um, and I've been working in Melbourne as an iOS developer since then. Um, I'm currently uh, working at a place called Art Processes, um, working on an app for the Smithsonian Institute uh, in Washington, DC. Um, Art Processes are world leaders in building location-aware apps for indoor spaces, um, with a particular eye to how people move around within a space. Uh, and you'll be familiar with their work if you've ever been uh, to the Mona Museum in Hobart. So what we're going to be looking at today is accessibility. We're going to look at what accessibility actually is and why it's so important. Uh, we're going to take a quick look at the, some of the accessibility modes that are available um, in iOS um, with uh, a special focus on uh, voiceover. Um, and then to wrap up, um, we're going to take a quick look at how we as developers uh, can actually use uh, the accessibility frameworks in our app. So, first things first, uh, what do we actually mean when we say accessibility? The Cambridge uh, English Dictionary uh, defines accessibility as the quality or characteristic of something that makes it possible to approach, enter, or use it. Uh, now, this is obviously a pretty general definition, um, but I think it's quite a good one. However, when we refer to accessibility, the accessibility in our products, um, we often mean something a bit closer to this. Uh, the design of products, devices, services, or environments for people who specifically experience disability. So we can also view accessibility as the ability for people to access and benefit from a system. So we're going to see later on in this talk um, that building for accessibility actually benefits everyone. Uh, but I think it's, it's particularly important to recognise that by making our apps accessible, um, we can significantly improve quality of life for people with disability in particular. So when we talk about the importance of building accessible apps, um, we're talking about building apps that are inclusive and apps that are able to be used by everyone. So our apps should be usable by people in the widest possible range uh, of abilities, uh, operating under the widest possible range of situations. Conversely, when we talk about accessibility, we're actually not talking about usability. So usability refers to the ease of use of a system, how easy it is to learn, how efficiently it can be used, uh, and how satisfying it is to use. Now, obviously, usability is crucially important for our apps, um, but usability isn't our focus today. So to summarise, usability is a measure of how easy it is to use an app, whereas accessibility refers to whether the app can be used by anyone. And today we're going to be focusing on accessibility. So why is accessibility important? Why should we care about making our apps accessible? I'm going to go through a short list of reasons, um, moving from what I think is the least compelling reason to build accessible apps um, to what I consider the most compelling reasons to build uh, accessible apps. So to start with, accessibility is actually good for business um, because practicing inclusive design makes our apps accessible uh, and available to a larger pool of potential customers. Uh, now, many people in Australia are actually affected by disability. 18% um, of Australians live with a disability that affects their daily activities. 12% um, of 35 to 44-year-olds live with disability. 50% of Australians, so that's half of Australians aged 65 or over, live with disability. And a massive 85% of Australians aged 90 or over uh, live with disability. And over the general population in Australia, uh, around 8% of males and half a percent of females um, experience colour deficiencies, such as colour blindness. Um, so... Sorry, to be honest, um, I don't think that the business case is a particularly compelling reason um, to make our apps accessible, um, but some people certainly do. Uh, the next reason that accessibility is important is that there's actually likely legislation that requires that we make our apps uh, accessible. 
Uh, under the Disability Discrimination Act of 1992, uh, Australian government agencies are actually required uh, to ensure that um, uh, any information or services that they provide um, are accessible in uh, a non-discriminatory manner. Um, so private businesses um, are also likely at risk of complaint um, under the Act if their tech is not accessible. But most importantly for me, um, accessibility empowers people with disability. When we make our apps accessible, we ensure that people with disability are able to do many of the things that many people take for granted. So with accessible apps, people can learn, flirt, they can manage their finances, they can create art, they can consume content. People who are blind or have a vision impairment can read the newspaper. People who are deaf or have a hearing impairment can watch movies. Uh, people with quadriplegia, with quadriplegia can have groceries delivered uh, directly to their home. So the improvement in quality of life um, that we can give a lot of people by making our, our apps accessible uh, is actually huge. Um, finally, um, the United Nations actually recognises accessibility as a basic human right. Uh, this is Article 9 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and it says up there, to enable persons with disabilities to live independently and participate fully in all aspects of life, state parties shall take appropriate measures to ensure to persons with disabilities access on an equal basis with others to the physical environment, to transportation, specifically to information and communications, including information and communications technology and systems, and to other facilities and services open or provided to the public, both in urban and rural areas. Um, and this, uh, this, this convention actually goes on uh, to say later on that uh, state parties, so governments, um, which Australia is part of, uh, should also compel uh, private entities to make their publicly uh, accessible services uh, accessible. <coughs> Finally, um, accessibility actually benefits everyone, um, not just people with disability. So making our apps accessible, for example, also benefits people without disabilities. Uh, for example, people using a slow internet connection, uh, people with temporary disabilities, such as a broken arm, um, and people whose abilities have changed due to ageing. Um, now, Apple have actually made quite a big uh, effort in the past to make their products accessible. Um, in fact, the, the, uh, the National Federation of the Blind in the USA um, publicly stated that Apple has done more for accessibility than any other company. Uh, here's what Tim Cook has to say about Apple's approach to accessibility. He says, we design our products to surprise and delight everyone who uses them and we never ever analyse the return on investment. We do it because it's just and right, and that is what respect for human dignity requires, and it's a part of Apple that I'm especially proud of. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at some of the accessibility modes that Apple makes available on iOS. Um, we'll start with um, accessibility modes for uh, people that are blind or have low vision. Um, the first and one of the most important accessibility modes is a thing called voiceover. Um, voiceover is a gesture-based screen reader um, that allows people that are blind or have a vision impairment to use their devices even if they don't see the screen. Now, because voiceover is uh, integrated directly into iOS, um, it's supported in all built-in iOS apps. Um, and it's actually quite easy, as us, uh, easy for us as developers um, to build our apps such that they're compatible with VoiceOver. Um, so VoiceOver allows users to control the screen reader, uh, which is a speech, synth speech synthesizer um, that speaks basically what's on the screen, uh, via a series of context-aware gestures. Um, and it scans the screen for text and other information to read to the user. Uh, VoiceOver is a crucial accommodation for people that are blind or have a vision impairment. Um, so we're going to come back and have a look at VoiceOver in a fair bit more detail shortly. Uh, next is display accommodations. 
With iOS 10, um, Apple released a number of display accommodations um, that allow you to do such things as invert the colours on your screen, enable grayscale, reduce the white point, uh, or toggle a range of colour filters um, to support people with colour blindness or poor colour vision. Um, and when we enable these filters on our devices, um, they apply to everything that appears on the screen of our phone. Next is font adjustments. Um, so iOS supports dynamic font sizing, uh, which lets users increase uh, or bold the size of uh, font and text in their apps. Um, dynamic type works with all built-in Apple apps um, and third-party apps where we choose to support them. Next is the zoom accommodation, uh, which allows users to magnify some or all of their screen. And finally, the dictation tool, uh, which allows users to talk instead of typing where they would usually enter text. Um, so after they do this, their words are run through voice recognition and then converted to text. Uh, next up, uh, accommodations for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, all iPhones are compatible with Bluetooth hearing aids. Um, there's a mono uh, audio accessibility mode. Um, so when we listen to music using headphones or we listen to audio using headphones, um, it's presented in stereo. So that's to say a different signal uh, is played into each ear. Um, when the mono audio accessibility mode is enabled, um, both the left and right audio channels are summed and played back through both headphones. Um, and this mode ensures that people who are uh, um, deaf or hard of hearing um, don't miss out on any content. iOS also supports closed captioning for videos, uh, so a transcript can be displayed on screen um, uh, while a video is playing. Um, iOS also provides a number of accommodations for people with varying levels of uh, physical and motor and learning and literacy skills, um, including support for switch control, touch accommodations, third-party keyboards, uh, and guided access mode, amongst others. Um, we don't have time to focus uh, on these today, um, but you're able to read more about them in Apple's accessibility documentation. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and take a more detailed look at VoiceOver. So VoiceOver is a gesture-based screen reader. Uh, and it's a, it's a very crucial tool that allows people who are blind uh, or have a vision impairment to interact with our apps. Uh, so let's spend a couple of minutes um, looking over how VoiceOver is actually used uh, so we can have a better idea how we develop for it. Um, first things first, to enable VoiceOver on your device, you can navigate to Settings, General, Accessibility, and then uh, VoiceOver. Now, Here's a tip to speed that up for when you're testing. Um, we can use a thing called the accessibility shortcut. And the accessibility shortcut is enabled by triple clicking the home button. Um, and what it does is it displays an action, an action sheet uh, overlaid on your screen similar to this. Um, you can customize this menu from settings in your phone to show you your most used accessibility modes. For example, uh, I regularly use the invert colors mode at night, um, so I keep that item in this list. Um, and having this, having this, uh, this mode selector uh, uh, available from anywhere on your device um, makes it much less of a, a hassle and a bottleneck to test accessibility when you're developing. Um, now, VoiceOver is quite an intricate tool, um, and there are far too many gestures that it responds to for us to go through all of them now. Um, but I think it's important that we take a quick look at uh, some of the more commonly used ones so we know how uh, people with um, uh, blindness or vision impairments uh, will actually use our apps. Uh, the first gesture that uh, is commonly used in voiceover is the one finger tap. Uh, now, if you one finger tap on any view in the screen, VoiceOver will speak identifying attributes about it based on its accessibility attributes. Um, you can also drag your finger around the screen while you're doing this, and VoiceOver will read items as your finger travels over them. 
Now, this is one of the most basic ways that people who are blind or vision impaired uh, can understand how to use and interact with our apps. The next gesture is a one-finger double tap. Uh, and when you perform a one-finger double tap, um, it activates the item that you currently have selected on the screen. Now, this is generally the equivalent of performing a single tap on a view when voiceover isn't, of, isn't enabled. For example, uh, when voiceover's on, if you double tap a UI button, it activates a button and sends a button press. The next gesture is the split tap gesture. And this is actually a combination of the last two gestures. So with two fingers, um, you can use one of your fingers uh, to drag and navigate around the screen. Um, and then without lifting that finger off the screen, you can tap anywhere else on the screen um, to select the item that your first finger is currently resting over. Um, if you guys go home and actually try this out on your device, um, you'll notice that it's actually much easier um, than lifting your finger to tap, um, especially on controls that have small hitboxes. The next gesture is the one finger swipe left or right. Um, and this gesture navigates to the next visible accessibility item. Uh, swiping forward moves forward and down the screen. And swiping left does the opposite. Next up is the one finger swipe up or down. Um, and this gesture performs different actions depending on the, uh, depending on the context. I see there's a mistake in the slide there. Um, but what, what, this, what this element, uh, what, sorry, what this gesture actually does um, is on adjustable ele elements like sliders, it increments or decrements the value of the element. Um, similarly, on text views, um, it moves the insertion point forwards or backwards. Um, and the last gesture I'd like to look at today is the two finger swipe up. What this gesture does is it reads all accessibility items in order, starting from the top of the screen. Um, this is very commonly used um, so that people can get uh, an, uh, uh, a uh, broad overview of everything that's on the screen at the moment. Um, finally, we can simulate the experience of a visually impaired user by using the screen curtain feature in iOS. When the screen curtain is on, VoiceOver turns our display off. So this is obviously great for testing um, visual accessibility as it forces us to rely solely on the information that VoiceOver speaks rather than being able to cheat and look at the screen um, as a sighted user would. Um, you can toggle the screen curtain uh, on or off by triple tapping the screen with three fingers uh, at any time voiceover is enabled. So now we've seen how uh, voiceover works and how it's commonly used. Uh, let's have a quick look at how we can build our apps to work with it. Uh, since iOS version 3, uh, UIKit has included the UI accessibility programming interface. Um, and through, through the UI accessibility protocol, um, we can provide, uh, we can provide uh, the operating system with accessibility information uh, about the views in our app. Um, this UI accessibility protocol is implemented on all standard UI kit views and controls by default. So when we're building our apps, um, a large part of the task of making them accessible is actually already handled by the operating system. Um, this means that for, for simple apps, um, adding accessibility can actually be uh, generally quite a simple task. Um, often all you have to do is add simple accessibility descriptions to your views. Um, the iOS SDK uh, also provides two main visual tools for us to help uh, make our apps accessible. The first one is the Accessibility Inspector pane in Interface Builder. Um, this pane uh, allows us to add and adjust accessibility information uh, about the views in our nibs uh, without having to go through the programmatic API. And the second tool is the accessibility inspector. Uh, and the inspector 
gives uh, runtime introspection of accessibility information via the iOS simulator. Uh, here's what the accessibility pane in Interface Builder looks like when a viewer is selected in a nib. Um, you can see here that we can enable and disable um, accessibility on individual elements. Um, and we can set the most commonly used properties, which are the accessibility label, the hint, um, and the traits. And we can do that uh, right here in Interface Builder a lot of the time without having to use uh, the accessibility APIs. Now, VoiceOver doesn't actually work in the simulator. Uh, instead, we use the Accessibility Inspector uh, developer tool to introspect uh, the accessibility elements um, in our apps. When the Accessibility Inspector is enabled, uh, we can see diagnostic information about our accessibility items, specifically their labels, values, hints, traits, uh, and frame coordinates for each element on screen. Now, in the past, we'd open the Accessibility Inspector by simulating a home button tap in the simulator, opening the Settings app, and navigating through to the Accessibility menu. Um, this changed at some point around Xcode 8, uh, but it looks like the docs were never updated. Um, now, to open the Accessibility Inspector, um, we do it through the Open Developer Tool menu uh, inside of Xcode. Um, and you can see I've got an app here. And this is the uh, Accessibility Inspector showing us information uh, about a view we've selected in the app. Um, now, it's important to remember that while the Accessibility Inspector is a very useful uh, debugging tool when we're developing our apps, um, it's not a very good substitute for testing the accessibility of our apps on actual devices. Now, we help tell VoiceOver what to say by using the UI Accessibility uh, API interface. This interface allows us to provide accessibility information about our views. Um, it's, it's comprised of two informal protocols, one class and a handful of constants. Um, first up is the UI Accessibility Informal Protocol. Um, and this protocol allows objects to report whether or not they're accessible. Um, and it lets us supply descriptive information um, about these objects for use by VoiceOver and other assistive technologies. Uh, and you can see that's a category on... Uh, NS object, which means that um, it's inherited by default. Uh, next up is the UI Accessibility Container Informal Protocol. Uh, this allows subclasses of UI view to contain multiple accessibility elements. Um, this container is useful when a single view draws multiple items um, that most users would consider to be distinct in terms of accessibility. Um, which themselves aren't subclasses of UI view. Uh, for example, this might be a custom painted icon or some custom painted text. Uh, next is the UI accessibility element class. Um, uh, instances, of, uh, instances of this class uh, represent an accessible item on screen. Um, and we can use this class to fake accessibility elements um, via an accessibility container when necessary. Uh, finally, there's the UI accessibility constants.h file. Um, this is a header file that defines the constants that accessibility traits can exhibit. Um, so let's take a look at what accessibility elements actually look like. So we've seen that accessibility elements represent uh, accessible views on screen. Um, accessibility attributes tell voiceover how and what to say about accessibility elements. Uh, now, there are five crucial uh, accessibility attributes. Uh, the first is the accessibility label. And the accessibility label is a short, localized word or phrase that describes the view, but doesn't identify its type. Um, now, if our accessible element doesn't contain text, then its accessibility label should be set to something that best describes what it is. So for example, um, this is a play button. Uh, 
uh, we might label its accessibility label as play. Uh, and it's important to note that we don't set its label to play button, we just set it to play. Um, and this is because the button type is actually described as a trait. Accessibility traits are bit masked combinations of the traits that best describe the element. Um, you can go and look for yourself uh, for the list of available traits uh, in the UI accessibility constants header. Um, and it contains traits like button, image, uh, selected, play sound. Um, for example, an element that behaves like a keyboard key and is currently selected might have the traits UI accessibility trait keyboard key and UI accessibility trait selected. And when voiceover uh, reads an accessible element, it appends the trait to the end of the readout. For example, if we set our play button to have the accessibility label play and the trait UI accessibility trait button, voiceover would read it as play button. Uh, next is the accessibility hint. And the hint is a brief phrase that describes the result of performing an action on an accessibility element where the result is non-obvious. For example, uh, a hint might be adds a title or downloads an attachment for buttons that do those things. Uh, next is the accessibility frame. Um, and this is a CG rect that specifies the frame of the accessibility uh, element in screen coordinates. Um, on subclasses of UI view, it defaults to the frame of the view, um, which is generally what you want. Uh, so we generally only need to set this um, when we're creating our own custom uh, UI accessibility elements to put in UI accessibility containers, uh, but we usually won't need to alter this. Uh, finally, there's the accessibility value. Um, and this represents the, uh, the current value of an element where the value isn't represented by its accessibility label. For example, a volume slider might have an accessibility label of volume and a value of 50%. Now, of these five properties that we just looked at, only the label and the frame are mandatory. The label attribute is required so that voiceover can report the element uh, to users. And the frame attribute is required uh, because accessibility elements must uh, report where they're actually located on the screen uh, so that users can interact with them. Um, but the accessibility trait, hint, and value are all optional properties. Um, now, the iOS Accessibility Programming Guide provides a set of guidelines for creating useful accessibility labels and hints. Um, I think it's particularly important for us as developers to create good labels and hints uh, because when VoiceOver users use our apps, it's predominantly through these descriptions um, that they understand how our apps work and how they should use them. A good way to think about how to write an accessibility label is to think about how a sighted user, uh, sorry, to think about what a sighted user would infer about your app by just looking at it. Um, so for a well-designed app, a sighted user would usually be able to tell what a control does uh, by simply reading its text or looking at its picture. Um, and this is the information that we should convey in the accessibility label. <coughs> um, so if you provide a custom control of you, uh, there are a few things that you need to consider when creating your accessibility label. So accessibility labels should very briefly describe the element uh, that they're representing. Uh, for example, play, stop, add, or delete would be good labels. Now, ideally this is a single word, uh, but sometimes it's necessary to provide more detail uh, based on the context of our app. For example, uh, sometimes we might say play music or uh, add to event. Uh, accessibility labels uh, should not include the type of the control or view. Um, the reason for this is that this information is reported by the accessibility trait of the element, um, so we shouldn't repeat it here. Um, 
For example, uh, before, if we'd, if we'd set uh, the accessibility label on our play button to play button, um, VoiceOver will actually read it out as play button button. Uh, and that's because UI buttons have the button trait set by default. Uh, accessibility labels should begin with a capitalized word and not end with a full stop. Um, and this just helps the speech synthesizer uh, provide the correct inflection when it's reading out uh, our accessibility information. Uh, finally, accessibility labels should be localized. Uh, now, VoiceOver speaks in the language that the user specifies uh, in their international settings. Uh, so if our app is localized for different regions, uh, our accessibility information should also be localized. So when we follow these guidelines uh, and take care to create a good, solid accessibility content, um, we can help to ensure that our app is accessible by as many people as possible. So today, uh, we covered a heap of really important stuff around accessibility on iOS. Uh, we looked at what accessibility is, why it's so important, um, some of the accessibility features provided by the operating system, specifically voiceover, uh, and how we can actually uh, develop our, acts, our apps to be accessible. Um, I'd encourage everyone to seriously consider uh, the way they're going to approach accessibility um, from the start when you build your apps. Um, and the reason for this is that adding accessibility um, uh, actually makes a, a very meaningful difference uh, in the lives of a lot of people. So thanks for coming and learning a bit about accessibility. Um, I'd like to say an extra special thanks to Paris, John, Tony, Tim, and Mars for putting on uh, yet another excellent dev world. Uh, thanks again for having me. Um, and do we have any time for questions? Oh, perfect. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Um, and oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so the 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 question there was whether the accessibility hint um, is read out. Um, uh, after the accessibility label is read by VoiceOver. Um, and that's correct, it is. Um, the reason that hint is a separate thing is that um, uh, VoiceOver users can actually toggle the hints uh, on and off. Um, so when they become familiar with apps, um, uh, it's faster for them to use uh, without the accessibility hint. So I think yeah, sure. So I th I think the question is um, if we have um, a, a relatively complicated view that contains quite a lot of information, yeah. but broken up into um, a lot of separate smaller views, um, is it possible uh, to? Uh, make our app accessible such that uh, rather than the user having to tap or scroll through every small view, um, are they able to just tap on the larger view and yeah, that's right. Yeah, and so this is this is a thing that comes up with, uh, I mean the obvious example is a, a table view or collection view cell. Um, and a technique that we often use in these sorts of situations is um, turning off uh, the, access of the is accessible property in uh, the subviews um, and enabling it on a master view somewhere. Um, so for example, that might be your cell's content view. Um, you, would, you would make your content view aware of the content in it um, and have the content view be uh, accessible and selectable uh, 
Um, so in that way, um, uh, we can uh, make our accessible content um, much easier and friendlier to use. Um, so users can scroll through, uh, you know, cells or complicated views quickly rather than um, having to fiddle around with uh, the complicated sub views. Does that make sense? Um, how do you mean amylation? Uh, no, sorry, uh, UI text. I mean. The text. Uh, UI test. Oh, uh, the UI test. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm actually not sure. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, so the question is, I think, how we handle uh, accessibility with buttons that change state. Um, for example, uh, a play pause button um, can be in multiple states, and obviously the accessibility information should change depending on which state it's in. Um, so when I would do this sort of thing, um, generally I would use the same button, for example, for play and pause. Um, and what we actually do is um, we need to store the state of that button somewhere anyway, and we need to manage it. Um, and I think, I think uh, a, a technique that a lot of people use in this situation um, is actually as they update um, the visual state of their button and the state of the logic uh, in their models, um, they actually update the accessibility information uh, on the button itself at that same time. Um, and I, I, don't think, I don't think there's um, an easier way around that. Great, thank you. Uh, so that's all we've got time for. Thanks again for coming, and uh, everyone enjoy the rest of the conference.